Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, the Bush presidency is long gone, but the abuses of his so-called war on terror continue. Andrew Coburn discusses what's wrong with the way the U.S. fights war. And later in the program, we look at the story of Fad Ghazi, who's been at Guantanamo since he was 17. He's now 30. All that and a few words from me on drones, the United States, and listening. Welcome to our program. Drone warfare here to stay. It's one of the few things Republicans and Democrats seem to agree on. Our next guest has been a rare critical voice on this subject. Andrew Coburn is the Washington editor of Harper's Magazine and the author of many books on war and international politics. His latest is Kill Chain, The Rise of the High-Tech Assassins. Andrew also happens to be my uncle. Welcome to the program. Hello, Laura. <laughs> so when we say drone warfare, just quickly, what exactly do we mean? Well, we mean it's a loose term, but it means, you know, this whole practice we've embarked on in the last 14 years of um, killing our enemies by extreme, or people we deem to be our enemies, by extreme re remote control. Um, basically, these planes, which are, you know, sort of giant model airplanes, which and we've devised means, which I must say are quite impressive, of controlling them from a large distance, like 12,000 miles, and seeing more or less what they see, I mean, receiving pictures from what they see, and using that to target people on the ground and fire missiles at them. And how many drone attacks have we had so far this year, say, or the latest data you have? Um, not that many, actually. Things are wound down a little. Um, quite a few we don't know about in Syria, but otherwise it's been like four or five in Pakistan and another three or four in Yemen and a few in Somalia. Um, but more under this president than anyone before. Oh, absolutely, yeah. No, no. I mean, in fact, George Bush, let's hear it for George Bush. Um, he was actually quite restrained in his use of deployment of drone assassination because he preferred to capture people and torture them. A, bit. <laughs> a chacun son goût. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so in, in Bush's day, the CIA basically was constrained by they had to actually really have a good identification of who it was they were shooting at and you know, absolutely know who it was. And then in his last six months, Bush was persuaded by the CIA that this really wasn't good enough and they should be allowed to fire at people they, who looked like terrorists. It's, it was called patterns of life, and there's all sorts of fancy sort of terminology associated with it. But basically, people who, you know, walk like a duck, you know, all that. So they, uh, and then things began to climb, and when Obama moved in um, with John Brennan at his side, then they really went to the races. Um, they peaked in 2010 with, I think, 110 strikes mm. in Pakistan. So the effect on the ground is what? We've talked to Kathy Kelly and others who've been to Afghanistan and describe a pretty terrified environment. Right. Well, the, the effects on the ground, well, it depends where you want to look. The effects on the ground of, uh, you know, destroying our enemy Al-Qaeda, kind of not so, not so impressive. It seems to be still in business. Effects on the ground for the people, not, not good at all. Um, because, I mean, what people say, I mean, like in Yemen and in Pakistan is, you know, it's their constant presence um, is one thing. I mean, like, you know, you hear them. You can hear this bzz, 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 bzz. Um, So all the time, all the time you hear that, you know, in, in Waziristan where they're a big presence all the time. So you never know yeah. if suddenly someone has decided your pattern of life approximates to that of a Al-Qaeda personnel and up you go in flames. I mean, there was a very, I mean, it's been quoted a lot, but there was a testimony of a Pakistani child whose granny had been killed um, by a drone who testified in Congress a while back, who said, I mean, that, you know, we don't, you know, now we don't, we pray for cloudy days. We That's can't right. play in, on sunny days anymore. So there's that, but there's all sorts of other effects like because people have noticed that the, the, there's a tendency to target gatherings, uh, 
uh, which you know could be you know on the guys. I guess it's a pattern of pattern of life that you know these will be Al Qaeda meeting right. or something. But so people don't really go to wedding parties anymore. People don't go to funerals. Um, and also local government. You said sort of the mechanisms by which communities were governed and made decisions. Of absolutely, the jergos. I mean, it's how you know people would sit around and thrash uh, and talk it out. And I, you know, I describe in the book. There was one such in uh, March um, 2011 um, when there was a jerga to discuss a local problem, which was who had who had rights to a chromite mine, uh, which is one of the few things. It's a very poor region. People can sort of live off. And there were 40, 40 or so, more than just over 40 elders sitting around in a couple of circles. And two missiles came down, landing in the middle of the two circles, and blew them away. So there's that. Um, there's other sort of effects I find very sort of creepy, like um, it's the sumptuous. The, the belief is that the CIA locates its targets thanks to little chips, people talk, they talk about chips that, you know, that they, uh, and these are really like little transponders that, um, uh, that help to sort of guide the, uh, guide the drone. So that you, uh, the idea is that the informant puts this in the back garden or the, you know, the glove compartment or whatever of the suspect's car, and that means they can be located and down it comes. So the paranoia is that, say you're having a disagreement with your uh, <coughs> neighbor about the sheep, you know, your, the, your sheep straying into their garden, they happen to have one of these chips, and next thing you know, there's one in your, um, you know, on your windowsill, and up you go. So great for creating domestic uh, absolutely. Calm so it's and, and widespread, good really, really destroys the society. So let's go back a little bit. I mean, a lot of people talk about computer killing, robot war. You have high tech assassins, but your argument in the book is that, in a sense, this has less to do with the technology than an ideology. An ideology having to do with cutting off the head. What do you call it? Node. Critical nodes. Critical nodes. Absolutely. That's Where's it. That people, people are transfixed by the talk about the new technology. It's not really that new. I mean, the thing that really made drones possible was um, was GPS, so you could navigate them, you know, when you couldn't see them, and um, you know, high, you know, satellite, you know, exp explosion of bandwidth, so you could control them. Um, but you're quite right. It's the ideology that's really important. The I the idea which goes back to. I really started in the beginning of World War II, just before World War II, that the the enemy is is like a machine. Anything, well, you know, all of human exists. Anyway, so say the enemy is like a machine, and therefore what you have to do is identify what they call the critical nodes. You know, the bit, the essential bits. Mm -hmm. And if you remove them, then you're home free. So the beginning of just before World War II, the Army Air Force, as it then was, they, after much research, they'd identified 154 targets in Nazi Germany, which they said were absolutely key to the functioning of the German war machine. And they proposed to destroy those with their new high-tech, mm -hmm. super accurate, precise bombsite mechanisms. And once they'd done that, the war would be over because the Germans would collapse. And, you know, and of course, didn't that didn't happen. As we know, the list expanded to, you know, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of targets. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, with that real effect in winning the war. But that ideology mm -hmm. became in, ingrained. And it's really the same one we have today where, you know, if you get the Mr. Big in the whatever terrorist group you're thinking about, uh, then all else will follow. They somehow they'll fall apart. It, it, the drug war played a role in it too, which I didn't know until I read your book. Absolutely. Um, in the beginning, in the early nineties, the Drug Enforcement Administration, the DEA, which had been, at that up to that point had been like kind of the poor stepchild of, you know, of law and national security, law enforcement, treated with derision, treated like dirt by the FBI and the other big guys, the CIA. They had a new, rather smart administrator, as a lawyer called Bonner, who figured out, well, he adopted what he called the kingpin strategy. He said, no, no more are we going to sort of sit around and try and capture big consignments of drugs coming to this country, or even small consignments. We're going to go after the kingpins, the masterminds of the, particularly the, uh, the Colombian cocaine cartels, who are, um, who are supervising these right. nefarious operations. And we'll get them, and by implicitly, Good things will follow, like we'll be achieving our mission, which, of course, 
uh, was to reduce the supply, presumably reduce the supply of drugs into this country. So why doesn't it work? I mean, it sounds like it should work. You cut off the kingpin, the machine falls apart. That's what everyone who listened to Bonner thought. Um, not so. It turned out that when you remove the kingpin, well, it turned out what happened. People began to know, or some, someone noticed, that while all this was going on, the supply of cocaine, in, in one case, this country was steadily increasing. Um, how so? Well, after a bit of reflection, it became apparent that if you remove, say, what cartels do is control price and supplies to make mm -hmm. more money for the cartel. Uh, so if you, re if, you, if you remove the head of the cartel, what do you get? You get two cartels, or you know, and then four, and then six, and then. As the thing starts to fall apart, and you get competition as each so surviving faction looks to gain market yeah. share and increases supply and lowers prices. So that's what happened. <laughs> so the exact opposite of what was the goal. Exact there's that, and then there's also, isn't this stuff all supposed to be illegal? I mean, not only does it not work, but it's supposed to be illegal, isn't it? Isn't there a law oh, against political Oh, Executive Order 11, whatever it is. Anyway, they uh, first brought in by Ford after the scandals of the Watergate era, when it turned out the CIA had been sort of running a murder inc around the place. And there was announced there was a ban, you know, the United States will henceforth, no one shall engage in assassination. And that's still proclaimed. That's our policy. No assassination. Well, very simple to get around that one. You just call it something else. And in fact, even within a few years, they were sort of finding wriggle room. The Israelis uh, had a good name for it. Well, the Israelis, I say, they were actually ahead of us in euphemism. Um, <laughs> Why am I not surprised? Because they called it, uh, we now, we still, we called it, you know, we settled on targeted killing. No assassination, just targeted killing. But the Israelis, they had called it targeted a killing, and then an, an attorney general in Israel thought this sort of sounded bad, so he decreed that sort of from now on it should be called focused prevention. Uh, we're not assassinating people, we're just focus, focus, focusing prevention or whatever. So, and they, of course, in other ways, um, uh, have been a huge um, influence on the American program. Well, there's so much disturbing about what you've just said, about everything that you've just said. Sorry. But I do have to try to get my, hand, my, my head around how it be continued to be not effective, not legal, possibly counterproductive, nonetheless, the most successfully growing aspect of our military strategy. You left out profitable. Um, because this, you know, by a funny, not so coincidence, I don't think, um, this strategy, this ideology, brings all various things, uh, attractive things in its train, which is, you know, it requires a lot of investment. Um, not just the drones themselves, which contrary to what they like to say, are actually quite expensive once you lump everything in. But this whole vast system of command and control, um, the whole huge, I mean, you get huge bureaucratic empires. You know, the, the, there's the Air Force as a thing. Now, they used to call it just intelligence and they had reconnaissance. Now there's a vast sort of Air Force bureaucracy called ISR, Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance, with thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people looking at video screens all day long. Um, so there's that, the CIA, it gave a whole new lease of life to the CIA who had, you know, messed up beyond belief. Uh, the counterterrorism terrorist expert, so-called, had sort of blown 9-11. And they found a new lease of life, not just in counterterrorism generally, but in the drone program. There's a whole career track now at the CIA of Targeter, where you can spend your entire career sort of looking for people to kill and sort of figuring out how to get them. So you now have the military and the CIA doing it, which suggests competition. Right. They competed. Well, they, in a way, they divided up. The, well, they, the market was divided up between them. Largely, the CIA had Pakistan. The military had uh, Afghanistan. The, uh, uh, the military had Somalia. And they shared Yemen for a while. So you could be potted by either a CIA or a... Uh, joint, uh, you know, special forces drone. Now, this is all assuming the drones actually work. You started by saying they don't work very well. You can't see well, that. Well, in now. terms of, like, like with the drug war, they don't uh, achieve their, uh, their state's objective. Just as in the drug war, we kill, you know, we had the kingpins, which actually increased the supply of drugs. Um, it turns out with assassination, I don't want to confine this to drones. Um, I'll get into the particular deficiencies of drones in a second, but... Um, with, with the assassination program, it turns out, again, to have 
precisely the opposite of the purported, you know, officially intended effect. Because, and someone actually did a did a study of this in Iraq, um, uh, in an intelligence cell. They uh, um, they took a took a took a list of two hundred people, two hundred insurgent or IED cell leaders they were called, um, who they'd killed in the previous four or five months. And then they looked to see what happened then. Mm. Um, and obviously the idea would be you kill the leader, things get better for you. Um, mm. The enemy gives up, life becomes quiet. Not a bit of it. They found out that on average, and this was like very, this wasn't just seat of the pants stuff, this was these very precisely studied. They looked to see what had happened. Uh, they compared the number of attacks on American local units um, in the 30 days before they'd got the leader in the 30 days after. And it turned out that attacks went up mm. immediately uh, by 40%. Mm. Uh, and then sort of after, that was after three days, after five days, they were, um, they were up sort of 20%. Mm. And then it sort of tailed back to normal, um, which was the way it had been before. I read the end of your book where you put out a hypothesis. That I don't think you totally get behind, but the hypothesis that there might even be an intention behind making the Taliban more cruel, more crazy, more maniacal. Have you revisited that in the light of ISIS? Is there any? Well, we've had some disturbing revelations that they uh, recently that you know, or confirmations, I should say, really that you know. ISIS, the growth and prosperity of ISIS, was certainly the plan in Syria. They thought it was this sort of mad desire to get rid of Assad. I don't know. The, I, I, the story you're alluding to, it really, if I can tell it very quickly, uh, the, back in 2008, the military, the U.S. military thought they'd won a, the U.S. thought it'd won a great victory in Iraq. The surge had worked. They'd beaten al-Qaeda and everything was great and they could come home. Or well, not come home, but go on to Afghanistan. Then they, um, so they had the, the Taliban, they were thinking, this was, this was definitely the plan. They said, well, how did, why, why did we do so well in Afghanistan, We're in Iraq? Well, really, it was because al-Qaeda, by being so horrible and brutal and vicious, had alienated right. the Sunni population. So what we need is an insurgency that's so horrible and vicious and brutal, they'll alienate the local politicians. So let's kill the sort of moderate, more sort of easygoing Taliban leadership, which will inevitably produce, because someone had read, they'd read that 2007 study, produce a more vicious, younger, more aggressive, nastier uh, mm. Taliban leadership, who will then go on to alienate the, politi the, the uh, population. Part one worked. <laughs> they, did, <laughs> they did produce a more nasty, uh, vicious, etc. Taliban. Part two didn't in the population still thought, well, the, you know, we want no part of it, whatever, either we support the Taliban mm. or we certainly want the Americans to go away. Do you ever interview these ex these incredible military sources that you have hundreds of in the book and just say, what are you thinking? Oh, well, they, I mean, they, I mean, you get them sort of talking to them um, with that, especially if they're not going to be, if they, yeah, it's a commendable degree of cynicism in the in the military. They, I mean, they say whatever you know. Keep, you you say what's going on, and answer that question. They said, oh, keep the money flow going. So cynicism rules inside and out. That's oh, the yeah. takeaway. One of them. <laughs> the book is Kill Chain: The Rise of the High Tech High Tech Assassins. You can get more information and a copy for yourself at our website. Fad Ghazi is one of dozens of men at Guantanamo who've been cleared for release but remain imprisoned. Politics and his Yemeni citizenship is the reason Fad remains trapped. Here's his story. فهد كان عندنا في البيت وهو صغير كان دائما يخرج الشارع يلعب مع الأولاد الصغار عند كتب فهد 
التي درسها آخر سنة وهو في ثالثة ثانوي لم نخرجها من مكانه الذي كان يذاكر فيه تجلس هنا تركنا هناك من أجل تكون ذكريات متجددة في كل وقت كل ما نراها وكل ما ندخل ذلك المكان نراها أمامنا فنتذكر فهد أن سافر أخي يمكن أخي فهد بعد أن سافر من عندنا يمكن حوالي في حوالي شهرين ما جاءنا لا اتصال ولا رسالة في عندما أرسل لنا رسالة عندما أرسل أخي فهد رسالة من هناك أول مرة أسمع بحاجة اسمها قنتنا اسمي محمد عبد الله أحمد غازي عمري أو أربعون سنة فهد هو أخي وشقيقي وهو بعدي يعني حوالي بتسع سنوات Fahid is from a, a small village uh, about three hours from Sana'a in Yemen called Beit Ghazi. It's an idyllic mountain town, an agrarian culture based around farming and religion and family. Fahid Ghazi was one of the first men to arrive at Guantanamo. He was just a few months past his high school graduation. He was 17 years old at the time, a juvenile. He's been detained at Guantanamo for 12 years. He's almost 30 years old now. He was cleared for release by President Bush in 2007 and cleared again by President Obama in 2009. That was an excerpt from the short film Waiting for Fahd, produced by our friends at the Center for Constitutional Rights. You can see more of that story at our website or at ccrjustice.org. Almost a year after the re-election of Barack Obama, Florida Congressman Alan Grayson decided to hold a hearing. The number of drone attacks was going up, not down. Sparse news reports, mostly from military sources, weren't making much of an impact. In October 2013, then, Grayson decided to invite a Pakistani family who'd experienced an attack themselves to Capitol Hill to testify. On October 29th, Rafikul Rayman and his family came to Washington, including 13-year-old Zubair, who was gravely hurt in the U.S. attack. Zubair had been reluctant to make the journey for fear he wouldn't be welcomed in the USA, but the strike that maimed him also killed his beloved grandmother. So welcomed or not, he decided it was important to come and tell the story. Quote, My grandmother and I used to share a love of bright blue skies, he began. The sky in their village was particularly blue October 24th, 2012, the day before Eid, the biggest festival of the year. Zubair and his grandmother were finishing their work in the fields before celebrating began. He said they could see and hear a drone hovering over their heads, but they didn't worry. Quote, why would I worry? Neither my grandmother nor I were militants. When the drone fired the first time, the whole ground shook and black smoke rose up, he said. We ran. But several minutes later, the drone fired again. He spent Eid in agony in the hospital, as it turned out. It would take his family months to save up the money for the care that was ultimately able to remove the shrapnel from his injured leg. The drone killed his grandmother in front of him. As Zubair told the legislators, I no longer love blue skies. In fact, I now prefer gray skies. The drones do not fly when the skies are gray, and for a short period of time, the mental tension and fear eases. I know that Americans think the drones are the answer, he continued. I wish they could understand how I and other children in my community see drones. We used to play outside all the time. Now people are afraid to even leave their houses. Children have stopped going to the few schools that exist. Education is impossible as long as drones circle overhead. I hope that by telling you about my village of my grandmother, I can convince you that drones are not the answer, concluded Zubair. More importantly, I hope I can return home with a message that Americans listened, that America's not just drones that terrorize us from above, but a country that listens and maybe, just maybe, America may soon stop the drones. Was Zubair's trip worth it? Is anybody listening? It's been almost two years. What message do you think is getting to his village? Write to me and tell me what you think. Laura at grittv.org. And thanks.
Today on The Laura Flanders Show, is socialism still an American taboo? Not so much, says Professor Richard Wolff. I was hesitant, for example, to schedule a discussion of socialism, but so many people asked that I realized, okay, the taboo has been broken. Nor was it ever, says Nation columnist John Nichols. America has uh, a very rich, uh, radical, socialist, social democratic history. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, we talk to Israeli activist Ronnie Barkan. I think that the greatest success of Israeli propaganda is to convince the world that the situation is complicated. And travel to Gaza for an exclusive interview with Professor Haida Eid. And we must start fighting for civic democracy. One person, one vote. And therefore, we need to come up with a democratic alternative, a secular democratic alternative.